first and foremost, decarbonisation of hydrogen production is a problem. So to, to, to move into the world of hydrogen being an opportunity for decarbonisation, you've got to first understand that at the moment it is a big problem. From a, a uh, so if we, if we forget hydrogen planes and heating and all these other wacky things, just the amount of hydrogen that we use right now for ammonia production and in the hydrocarbons in, in oil and gas, the production of that hydrogen needs to be decarbonised. Hello everybody, Quentin here. It's another special episode and you have to forgive us, but we're playing with the format a little bit. And we're gonna talk about something that's not really battery related. So this is a conversation between me and Will from Octopus Hydrogen. And we are gonna talk about the hydrogen economy and what all this means. It's hydrogen, it's an element, it's not new, but this new hydrogen economy and everything that's going on around it is fascinating. And there are a load of business models that are being set up to, to capture it. And I think those of you who know me will know I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm very skeptical of a, a lot of the use cases for hydrogen. But what I found really interesting about this conversation is Will and the Optimus Hydrogen team, I think, are taking a pretty pragmatic approach. And I think their business model is interesting. They're trying to solve some, some big problems. You'll notice in the conversation that we didn't necessarily agree on everything. And that's okay. But I do believe that we tackled this issue with intellectual honesty. But that's not for me to decide. That's up for you and all the listeners to decide. So really want to know what you think about this in comments or do send an email or let us know. A tricky topic to cover. Yeah, this is probably going to get some, some, some conversations going. So let us know what you think and I hope you enjoy it. Hydrogen. Today is all about hydrogen. And um, for those guys listening, there's a lot of paper that you can hear because I've for once made notes and done a lot of research. And um, today we're going to go down some rabbit holes about the hydrogen economy, um, what to expect, what works and what doesn't, and um, see whether we can get some answers. So, Will, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Hello and welcome. Thanks for having me. I've been excited about coming on. I'm an avid listener. Oh, incredible. Say it, say it more, say it loud. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got Will from um, Octopus Hydrogen, the CEO and uh, founder of that business. And I guess before we get started, we, wh why, why are we talking about hydrogen on the Modo podcast? Um, and I've got some quotes here, so um, excuse the rustling, but here we go. So the German chancellor uh, called hydrogen the gas of the future and promised a huge boom. Japan's prime minister has declared that shifting to and developing a hydrogen society is critical for achieving decarbonisation. The EU Executive Vice President of the European Green Deal believes that hydrogen rocks. That's a big one. And Jacob Rees-Mogg said something, um, but we're not going to give him the airtime on this podcast. So, and the money is flowing as well. So the EU has approved the first 13 billion euros of 430 billion euros promised under its 2020 hydrogen strategy. They're now launching a hydrogen bank and the US Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, um, produce it, um, there's a 10-year tax rebate per kilogram of, for green hydrogen of $3, which may be more than the cost of production. So this thing is happening. Um, and that's huge. And we're seeing all of the consultancies are writing reports about it. The experts are writing reports about it. The lobby is magnificent in the hydrogen lobby and what it's achieving. Um, it's everywhere and there's different colors we've got green gray blue every shade you can imagine and we've got businesses of all shapes and sizes start up around this big this big huge thing that is hydrogen and so today um, I guess the first thing to say is I come from this as a little bit skeptical actually um, well very skeptical of a, quite a lot of the use case of hydrogen um, and I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I've got an open mind, and I'm hoping by the end of the, I'm willing to be convinced on lots of these. I just need to hear it from, I, I just need to, I, maybe I need to understand more, I don't know. But I'm coming at this with an open mind, um, and I'm really excited to have you on because you have done a lot of thinking about this, and I, res I respect your thinking. So, um, Will, where do we start? 
the main thing, to, let's, let's start with your business. Um, what do you guys do? And then we'll talk about hydrogen use cases and answer the key questions, which are what, what should we be using hydrogen for and what shouldn't we? And then once we've got that basis, how do we build businesses around that? So yeah, yeah what, what's, what's um, Octopus Hydrogen doing and what's the business model? Yeah, thanks. So I, I guess Octopus Hydrogen is effectively a developer platform. So what we intend to do is build electrolytic, we can cover the colors in a minute, but effectively electrolysis-based hydrogen projects co-located with renewables, but we don't want to own the wind or the solar asset. So our view is that co-location with those assets is positive, especially at this phase in the market. Just um, to be clear, so you turn electricity, and I know this isn't really chemistry, but you use electricity to create hydrogen. Is that is Yeah, that so effectively, I want to see mine off the shelf product. Let's yeah. not quite off the shelf as you'd like at times, but basically, big shelf. It, yeah, it's a it's a, a forty foot ISO container can contain about two megawatts worth of electrolysis. So you know, and you turn that into hydrogen, oxygen, vent the oxygen. Wow. So about the same megawatt terms, about the same size in a forty foot container as a battery. Yeah, obviously megawatt, not megawatt. Mega, hour. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And so, um, are we going to call them OE, uh, Octopus? Um, OE works for me. That's, a, that's our internal lingo. OE, yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to start at the start? You know, how did you start this business? What's your background? And um, how did you end up in hydrogen? And what's the business model? Yeah, no, so we, myself and Julius, uh, left our jobs at OVO. So, I, I, most of my formative years were at OVO Energy. Um, you know, as you, you probably know OVO pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I was there for a long time. Did a lot of different things. So, across kind of asset heavy businesses within that so smart metering and those kind of things consumer facing stuff both like retail ops and like product and then also a lot of the software side so the Kaluza platform was something sort of ed Connolly and i did a lot of work on when it first started there um i left there 2017 back end of 2017 and julius and i were kind of playing around with lots of different business ideas because we, we quit our jobs to start a business very similar to your story, we ended up pivoting. <laughs> um, what we did was we were looking at an energy retail business that was going to do behind the meter batteries for INC customers, whereby INC being industrial and commercial. So I guess the kind of non SME space, not small businesses, decent sized, but big, pretty big businesses. Factories, that kind of stuff. People, yeah, companies that make stuff and use energy. Yeah, or, or like big retail parks, you know, and, or big office buildings even potentially, but kind of where you've got a reasonably large supply going into that cool. building. Our hypothesis was that they want 24-7 carbon-free energy and they want it to be cheaper. Yeah. And so we felt behind the meter batteries was kind of a really cool sort of play on that because, you know, with a trading background as well, we kind of knew that you could stack the revenues and do something exciting. Then the targeted charging review came along killed that business off mm. and so we're like okay we've spent the best part of nine months of our lives working on this and we've got literally nothing to show for it and that was where the way that charges for network costs were well well <laughs> the, the report came out and then nothing happened for ages but essentially the the whole way that distribution network operators and transmission systems so national grid and dnos recover the costs all of that was being reviewed and changed and that affected the business case for these yeah so instead of everything being time-based it went to being smeared over volume regardless of when effectively yeah. and so you know the, the the value stack of shifting low behind the meter went from being very valuable because you'd missed you know to triad and all the other kind of ones that go down through to not very much left so, so you, you literally just had pure price shifting was like what was left kind of on a day ahead basis so you built this business and then that so came built, along we, we, <laughs> we were we were close to launching and then we had to pull the pin on it okay and then you moved into then then you pivoted into straight into this yeah so we, then we took the idea to uh, octopus energy to start an incubator so we were like look we really want to do something entrepreneurial we run out of ideas how about you guys help us think of some stuff that's kind of complementary to the group mm -hmm. uh, and then one of the businesses we incubated was octopus hydrogen and then we both uh, thought ah this is great we're going to go all in on it so we've kind of shut down that incubator now and this is the first one we did so it's quite a nice what a journey yeah you'd argue it was successful because i guess we incubated an idea that we're now working on so that's nice. I guess the idea was we were going to do more, but hey, hydrogen's a big problem, so it's like quite fun to be on something. Awesome. And so how long has um, Octopus Hydrogen been going? How many people are involved in the company? Let's get some scale to start with, and then we'll talk about what you do. Yeah, so we're uh, two years in April this year, so started, what's that, April 2020? No, t 21. Yeah, uh, we're about 25 people, uh, roughly say a third software engineer, software development, um, a third's kind of like commercially 
your your deal kind of structure team yeah. and then a third's kind of physical engineering roughly so uh, you know building the projects and making sure we can deliver on timelines etc from that side of things okay and what's the vision well, our vision is we believe, you know, in a 100% decarbonized society of the future. And what was apparent to us when we started the business was that, you know, we're going to electrify everything we possibly can. But we didn't believe that on its own, electrification could get us there. And it was kind of like we were looking at what was left. And we're like, well, we can't start an EV business because there's loads of good businesses in EVs. We can't start like a, a load shifting business because there's businesses that do that. And we're like, okay, but there's not a lot of stuff that kind of links together renewable generation assets and the kind of stuff that isn't going to get decarbonized through electrification i.e the molecule based bit so that's kind of why we started the hydrogen bit because it felt like a good gap because it was like there's lots of people talking about hydrogen but not a lot of them come from a power background a lot of them come from kind of oil and gas or physical stuff and we're mm. like we think power ultimately is what's going to make it I think cheaper it's actually a part of the big problem here <laughs> uh, folks used to building pumps and compressors um delving into where uh, the world where the the power side is the main input cost and the main you know that's the, that's the main driver of all of this and and, and the thing is with power it's time based the value of it changes over time whereas yes. it, it, you know something like, like natural gas it's it's not time based the value doesn't shift i mean it maybe just seasonally but mm. you know for a given period it doesn't shift in value you just have lots of it and then you've got to decide you know so you can live with losses you can live with running your planet 24 7 because you don't care about when you run it relative to other assets, right? So what does Octopus Hydrogen do? So we kind of got two two bits of our business. So the first bit is, as I said, we're a developer platform. So effectively what we do is we go from, we try to work with builders of wind and solar assets and say, would hydrogen add value to your either in-build or to-be-built renewable asset? So is that um, <coughs> people who are building wind, is this one wind turbine? Is this a whole wind farm? Is it an offshore wind farm? You know, what scale are we talking about yeah. here? For us, the sweet spot at the moment is kind of where we can build a between 5 and 20 megs of electrolysis, which is about needing 50 to 100 meg of renewable asset, depending on the, what that is. Yeah, if it's solely need a bit more, yeah. if it's wind, a bit less. I think anything less than that, you're getting into too small a scale on the hydrogen side to kind of warrant the economics of running it and maintaining it and operating it. And anything bigger than that, realistically, there isn't many onshore assets being built at that scale so therefore you by definition you're going offshore and therefore you're kind of getting into substation yeah. level stuff and i think that will be where we'll go in the future but for now I, I don't think we really bring enough to the kind of yeah we're going to do a gigawatt you know we'll let that be a 2025 problem so i've got some numbers now so we're looking about five to 20 megawatts in size renewable generator uh, 100 megawatt ish renewables five to 20 on the elect uh, electrolyzer and you're looking for those sites and developers and saying, we can build electroly electrolysis on site or near or something like that. So that's one half of the business. Well, so Ooh. basically, almost all developer planning permissions now go in with the, a square drawn on them for batteries. Yeah. Because hydrogen's effectively a similar footprint, you can swap battery for hydrogen asset. Yeah. So it's quite easy from that perspective. I'm not saying, you know, it's a different yeah, permitting yeah. process, but most developers we talk to are kind of like, cool, well, we're interested in moving into something new as well. And we've already got enough of a kind of concept from a space perspective to accommodate what you're trying to do. So it kind of works quite well. Okay, cool. And then that's, that's, that's the development side of the business where you're going to build electrolyzers. Is that right? Yeah. Develop and build electrolyzers. So we do, you could argue that we take on a lot. We do kind of like the EPCM side of it as well. So we do the design of it. I mean, you're an early business. You do everything, right? <laughs> in, an, in, a, in an early uh, an early market um, with an early technology. So, of course, you're just going to do everything and see what sticks. Yeah. And what, what we definitely try not to do, though, is we don't get involved with the renewable. Right? Yes. That's a sole problem. There's good businesses in that space. They've got low cost of capital. We don't want to, like, yeah, we'll actually build a wind turbine as well. We're like, <laughs> no, we'll leave that to people who do a good job. Yep. Um, so we'll do the bits that we kind of think are not solved problems. Okay. So one side of the business will build electrolyzers and fund them, too? Do you fund them on balance sheet? Do you get in? I mean, how First does it... ones are funded on balance sheet. On Octopus Energy's balance sheet. So Octopus Energy. The Octopus Hydrogen's balance sheet. Octopus Hydrogen. Yes, yeah, so we don't put them into, say, energy or renewables. At the moment, we use our equity capital to own our assets. Wow. And it's Octopus Octopus Hydrogen fully owned by Octopus Energy? It is. Oh, man, I'll just go straight in. It's 70-30. So 30% is owned by Hydrogen employees and 70% is owned by OE. Okay, cool. Great. All right. So we've got Octopus Energy owns um, the budget. Uh, no. 
less than the majority of octopus hydrogen. It was a majority, but not the controlling majority, I suppose. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then, so, and then octopus hydrogen d is going to build these electrolyzers. And then what does the other bit of the business do? Yeah, and then so our other bit of the business, which is kind of like our other bet on this market, is we, we're starting a SaaS platform. No surprises there, I guess, given the background of a lot of the team, i.e. involved with Palooza, yep. OE's background with Kraken, you know, like it was always going to have a kind of tech play in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're effectively building the the Kraken for electrolysis. So, i.e., you know, you are building a renewable project, uh, you're building a hydrogen project that's electrolytic. So, i.e., it's, it's using renewable power to do it. And you're not going to run that 24-7 because you're never going to have 24-7 green cheap electrons. Therefore, you have to change when you run, given that f that kind of truth. And we're building the platform that controls that from a kind of a cost perspective, a greenness reporting perspective, and all the operating constraints that are hydrogen specific, because it's not like a big battery. You know? So if I've got this right, the, hi the hypothesis is that octopus hydrogen will build and operate, or build, whatever, someone will, someone will operate them, these electrolysis plants that will be renewably renewable energy powered. And then the other bit of octopus hydrogen will write software that will control these assets and at times vary their output because the cost base, the electricity price, will be too high for them to run. Yeah. So it's a bit like demand-side response with electrolysis. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so the reason why we think there's a gap for the software side of things is, say, unlike a battery where you go in and out, but it's there's a capacity, there's a, a power and an energy capacity and because there's a lot of other problems you've got to solve, like thermally, et cetera. But effectively, you've got the BMS that handles a lot of that. And then ultimately, it's power and energy is the two things you're solving for. With hydrogen, you've effectively got indefinite depth, right? Depending on your offtake, so how much hydrogen and where it's going. So oh, you've got... With a, hydrogen, you've got indefinite depth. What does that mean? It's not just a case of saying, I, I want to... I want to produce X amount of hydrogen because it depends, well, how much can you store? how much can you store based on how much is going to be used? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of downstream dynamics that yes. link the power to the what you're doing with the hydrogen. So the optimization problem becomes more complex than simply what is the cheapest bit of power today? Yes, it's, okay. What's the cheapest bit of power relative to when I can actually produce hydrogen and store it? And then what about if I have to buy more expensive power because I'm short on hydrogen? Okay. So there's a kind of a more, I won't say more complex than batteries because... I don't know enough about how batteries are optimized, but it's a different set of optimization kind of constraints that need to be considered very specifically, is our, is our belief. So one of the interesting things about this discussion so far, I think for me, is the assumption that electrolysis plants won't run base load. They might need a varied output to match price signals in the electricity market, which I think is a, a key assumption. It's, I, I believe that, you know, I believe in huge volatility in electricity prices yeah. in the next decade or so, hence why I'm so bullish on batteries. And I guess that's a, that we're on the same page. Hypothesis, there. Same hypothesis. There. And and there's a lot of talk about oh hydrogen assets being expensive capex things that need to run twenty four seven. I'm like, well, that's just not. They are expensive capex things, but they don't need to run twenty four seven because if you look at it, seventy percent of the cost of a green hydrogen molecule is the cost of the power. By definition, if you it, it, the capex isn't the most important thing you're solving for. You're solving for finding cheaper power. Yes. And it needs to be green to qualify for any subsidies and to actually add value to the, uh, you know, our net zero economy. So going for cheap green power is the trick, not optimizing your capex. Like capex is important, but it's nowhere near as important as power, which is why we saw a gap in the market for kind of us as a power pedigreed kind of set of founders. Yes. And if you rather than just getting a supplier agreement with a supplier, if you can start hedging that power and you can also, it's, it, you know, the optimization problem is very similar to a battery, right? Um, and there is an asset that you can run if, uh, I guess you could, I guess you, you, in an ideal world, the electrolyzer would run base load, right? You'd want it to run all the time, provided- If you had 24-7, yeah. 40-pound a megawatt hour power, you would run it, yeah. you would run it on that basis. I don't believe that will exist yeah. in Western Europe, but no. Okay. All right. Let's, let's talk about colors of hydrogen for yep. a second, because if we can, I'd like this podcast episode to go- to, Start at the basics in all elements. Um, and I've got a bit confused with the color of hydrogen. I've been doing some research and I can't work it all out. So could you explain how that works? There's, there's like this thing, that the hydrogen rainbow. And I think the way I will like break it down in my mind is, okay, so, so and just to 
to give you a bit of background on it so bays you know in the uk are saying very clearly like we don't want a rainbow of hydrogen colors we just want a, a low carbon hydrogen standard that defines the amount of co2 per kilogram of hydrogen bays sorry just for anyone listening so bays is the department for business energy and industrial strategy so they're, they're the government and they are saying this thing yeah they're saying rather than having colors let's just have a standard that defines a carbon intensity and that's typically being agreed across the US, not not everyone's agreeing the same standard, but everyone's agreeing that measuring the CO2 per kilo is a better way than kind yes. of having labels. But I effect- agree. I, I would agree too. That said, I look like labels for simplicity purposes, which is there's green, which is you have to use renewable power. And for me, you have to temporally correlate with a renewable asset to demonstrate that. That's green. And then you have... Oh my, there's so many shades of green. We're going to come back to this, yeah? <laughs> yeah, well, okay. the, the point being, though, if you take grid average power, it will not be lower carbon than like, fossil-derived hydrogens at times. So it's really important to to demonstrate and have that pedigree of, of, of that you can demonstrate your actual CO2 intensity. Because if you don't, the, it, electrolysis is not very efficient. So if you use fossil fuels anywhere in that mix, you will very quickly tip over, you know, from the power generation side, sorry, you will tip over the CO2. Yeah. Which is so it's very care, you know, you've got to be cautious about this. Effectively, the other two major ones are grey or black, which effectively is fossil fuel derived hydrogen. Whether that be from coal or natural gas doesn't really matter. So, no, so, not most so, of it's from natural gas. So yeah. green is green is hydrogen from renewable generators, so from wind and solar plants, yep. for example, or nuclear. It, or it depends where you. I, yeah, some people I, call I, nuclear pink, but I, I mean, ultimately, I'm a big nuclear guy. I think it's green, but whatever. Uh, and then it, so would, it would tick the box on the low carbon hydrogen standard. Yeah. So for me, nuclear is yeah, probably going to be pink. The green mix. Brilliant. There's another one. I didn't see pink out there. And then there's grey and blue. And grey and blue. No, so, gray, so let's say there's grey and black. Grey and black, sorry. Effectively, they get bundled together as they are either from coal or natural gas. It's very, very carbon intensive. So if it looks like smoke, like grey or black, it's probably got some fossil fuels in it. Uh, yeah, to make it and then um what's the difference between gray and black how where do the gray come from black comes from coal and gray is natural gas derived effectively though so with natural gas so most of the hydrogen in the world that's used today is used for kind of two two key things one is refineries and default sulfurization in refineries so effectively what you do is you've got your crude you do your well, you know cracking. GCC chemistry you do your cracking and you put hydrogen in it and that helps get your kerosenes and your petrols and remove sulfur, et cetera. Most of the world's hydrogen is used for that. And it's almost always from steam methane reforming of natural gas. So put hot let's, let's slow this down a little bit. So that so most of the world's hydrogen at the moment is used for separating hydro, hydrocarbons into different, it's like the distillation column stuff. Exactly. Cracking it and separating it into the different types of hydrocarbons. And that, and we you, you put hydrogen in and that sort of happens and, and will allow the chemists to the side. Yeah. But that's what happens today. Yeah, and then the other use case for hydrogen today is ammonia production. Ammonia. Ammonia yeah. is NH3, so effectively it's nitrogen plus three hydrogen atoms, yeah. and most of that is made, I think the process is called the Harbour-Bosch process. I'm not an expert on that kind of thing. We don't look at ammonia particularly, but effectively it's grey hydrogen again, which is combined with nitrogen. And what's the ammonia used for? Typically, I mean, a lot of it's used for fertilizers, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's other applications for ammonia, but really, yeah, for feeding the world. So whether we should be using, a, let's say, fertilizers is a separate problem, but... Oh, it, yeah, it, don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's but, leave that one. <laughs> yeah, so, but 99% of the world's hydrogen is grey, let's say, comes from natural gas. So we're burning stuff to create hydrogen to do stuff Steam methane reforming, not burning. Steam methane... Oh, no, sorry, I'm thinking to get the... the oh, okay. Because if you burnt it, it would turn into CO2 and whatever else you get, water and heat. <laughs> okay. You, you blast hot water on it, which separates the CH4, methane, mm-hmm. into H. And so this is a different type of making hydrogen, right? This isn't what you guys are doing, which is getting no. renewable energy, electricity, and turning and making hydrogen. This is the other way, which happens at refineries or nearby. Yeah. Uh, like, and they're... It, you're creating the hydrogen by in this, in this other way. It doesn't use electricity. It's a chemical process. Exactly. But of course, it's going to be quite energy intensive. And it, I mean, and it's really CO2 intensive. Okay. Yeah. So, like, first and foremost, decarbonization of hydrogen production is a problem. So, to, to, to move into the world of hydrogen being an opportunity for decarbonization, you've got to first understand at the moment it is a big problem from a. a uh, so, if, a if we forget hydrogen planes and heating and all these other wacky things. 
just the amount of hydrogen that we use right now for ammonia production and in the hydrocarbon and in, in oil and gas, the production of that hydrogen needs to be decarbonized. Exactly. And that's now, a big problem in itself. Now, there's how much hydrogen will be needed in a net zero world when refining is lower? Yes. There's a, you know, but we still need plastics and things that come from oils that I don't think we have, biological. So there will yeah. still be a, and, you know, look, I don't think we're at peak use of things like kerosene and stuff for, you know, aviation in the developing world, et cetera. So, I, 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 you know, I think ultimately that is a problem that needs to be solved rather than one that we just dismiss and say, oh, well, you know, in a net zero world, it won't be here, so let's ignore it. You know, okay, so, problem. so that's problem number one. And then there's there's the, let's come back to the colours. So blue hydrogen is the one that's blue, missing. Blue, yes. So, so blue effectively saying, take the grey, all the stuff we talked about, yeah. and capture the CO2 using... The carbon capture and storage. Exactly. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat this back to you and hopefully I've, I've learned something. The black and the grey, that is not using electricity to make hydrogen, that's its other thing, steam reforming. Steam methane reforming. Steam methane reforming. That's used a load at the moment in the um, hydrocarbons industry, and we need to solve that problem. Then there's the blue, which is the same as the black and grey, but then you put the you capture the carbon from it, and you go store it somewhere in a I don't know, salt cavern or something like that. And then there's the green way, which is um, we're going to create hydrog hydrogen with electricity, and we're going to get that electricity from renewable sources like wind or solar uh, or something like that. Okay, I think I understand the colors. For me, now. that's where you kind of end. All the other shades, whether you, you know, whether it's pure solar or whether it's pure wind, doesn't really matter. Whether it's a blend of wind and solar, you know, all of those kind of things. Yeah, you know, whether it's hydro, I'm like, look, ultimately, it's either in the broadly green bucket, yeah, <laughs> the broadly not good bucket of grey, or it's in the blue where it's grey plus CCUS. The thing to note with the CCUS is though. CCUS being carbon capture, utilization, and storage. It's not a thing that we do today particularly well. Like the most effective carbon capture sort of processes we have now are roughly, say, 50, 60%, you know, and for the, that, that natural gas derived hydrogen to be at the kind of low carbon hydrogen standard definitions, we're talking it needs to be like 80, 90%, and with very low fugitive methane emissions. So, the whole idea of blue hydrogen being this kind of panacea that comes along because it actually it's almost as good as green is like there's a lot of burdens mm. of proof around that. That said, I do have some sympathy for, well, we already use loads of natural gas. We're adding more coal. Let's abate it or whatever, yeah. Yeah. So but it's like the equivalent, that's like sticking with the current process of black and grey and then putting like a vacuum cleaner around the top and sucking out the CO2 and sticking it somewhere. Yeah, and to be fair, if we did that, I'd be less offended by blue hydrogen. The problem is most of the blue hydrogen projects that are being kind of peddled at the moment are new build. <laughs> so we're going, hold on a minute. Uh, Let's leave all that stuff going. And what we're going to do instead is build a brand new purpose built blue hydrogen production facility. And that's going to decarbonize all these things down there. And, I, and my argument, well, why don't we just add CCUS onto all the existing gray hydrogen stuff? Because it's already there and it's unlikely to be replaced with green anytime soon. So let's just get on with that. That's my uh, skepticism of blue at times. Okay. And so, yeah, how do you guys make money? And how? Well, we are, we are pre-profit. Pre-profit, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, how are you going to make money? <laughs> That's a better question. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we, we see two things. So ultimately, the, the, the replacing grey hydrogen with green hydrogen, we believe is, is viable. So we've looked at where natural gas prices are today. We can compete with green hydrogen with grey hydrogen from a okay. cost perspective so in principle we're talking about you know look, we can't go to a refinery and do it at that scale today but there's lots of applications that are the scale we would be able to solve for today whereby we can replace their grey source with a green source so this is problem number one that we talked about before this is the existing hydrogen world get rid of the grey and replace it with green that sounds good to me exactly yeah we we're really pleased with that. It's good. Partly because of where natural gas prices are. When natural gas prices are at 50p a therm, it's not It's not parity. So you mean because natural gas prices are high right now? That, yeah. 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 Especially because we don't use grid power. Admittedly, you know, we have to do some clever power purchasing in the background. But yes, because we can, we use green electrons, which if you are not paying wholesale market spot price for, you can get at a 
yeah. sensible price per megawatt hour, we can compete with grey hydrogen on price. So your value proposition there is, hey guys, you already make grey hydrogen. Let us install this plant. You can do it in a green way and it'll cost you less. Or more specifically, we say, we will, we're building our own plants and we will deliver you the hydrogen. That's, i.e., you know, we don't ask them to build it on their site. We're like, well, we can get you the hydrogen at a price that you're equivalent to what you're already paying. Okay. So that's so our kind of ground one. We are, you know, cost parity, therefore we can make a margin on the hydrogen. Okay, cool. And that's how the company's going to make money. And then on top of that, there's a lot of optimization and software around that you guys are going to build. Yeah, I sort of see this hydrogen side is low margin, SaaS business is high margin. Yeah. We need to prove both of those. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and gonna, you need one without the other. You can't do one without the other, right? You actually... You kind of need to create the market in, this is the funny thing about the hydrogen industry, right? There's so much market creation happening because people need it for the next step. But in a normal, uh, uh, I'm gonna get, gonna get wrapped up in my own words here. In a, if we weren't in a climate emergency and everyone wasn't in a rush, normal capitalism would mean that some folks create markets and the market doesn't exist or some people, and it all sorts of happened because there's so much money coming in and, and subsidy washing everywhere. It's very difficult to work out which markets in a normal in, in a normal world w would make sense. That's sort of one of the one of the concerns. Coming back to green hydrogen, how do you make sure that the hydrogen? How do you make sure the electricity is green? Yeah, so this is actually like a hot topic in the hydrogen industry. Full stop at the moment. So you've got kind of different definitions floating around in the US, EU, UK. I'll give you my interpretation of what I think it needs to be. So, like my view is. If you just do like Rego backed, so I use certificates of origin backed, it's not enough because you've not got any temporal. I'm so glad you've said that. Yeah. So for us, the definition of green is relatively rich. We go for additional renewables, temporally correlated with the, with the certificate as well. What does that mean? Uh, can you explain that in simpler words? The renewables that we buy from need to be renewables that aren't existing, ideally beforehand, so we're not cannibalizing the electrons that were already on the grid. Okay. We want to match when those renewables that we are directly contracted with, or you could argue we can do some virtual sleeping, but let's say the renewables that we're actually working with, are we have to produce when they're generating. We can't produce... So when the wind blows at that wind turbine, that's when we're going to run the electri electrolyzer. That's and that's the green bit, right? Exactly. Now, time matched, actual megawatt matched. And we also buy the Rego for you know, five pound a megawatt. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's what we do. Sounds, now, there's a lot legit. of people lobbying for, no, no, let's do annual reconciliations with some regos and that'll be fine. And we're like, well, you'll end up with grid average power, which isn't that green. So which is the same problem with all these little startup, well, not necessarily startup, everyone was doing it. Everyone is doing it, right? Which is electricity suppliers saying they're green and it's not green power. Yeah, I mean, some of the, unfortunately, a lot of the ones that, well, let's not, I won't throw stones. Yeah. But yes, it's, it's been a, a big frustration. Right? It was a big frustration of mine and Julius's for a long time. You know, you buy a few Rigos and you class yourself as a green tariff and it's not green at all. Yeah. yeah. By the way, if you're listening to this and you don't know what a Rigo is, we did have an, op uh, an, ep an episode on this. Um, do check back and we'll put it in the show notes on how Rigos work. Very interesting. It's very easy to, th to throw stones and you can see why the market exists and a lot of sensible decisions got us here. Um, but very odd situation with Rigos and how that works. Okay, so I think we're on the same page with what green electricity looks like, which is good. Um, now let's talk about hydrogen use cases. So we talked about replacing grey and black hydrogen with green hydrogen. That sounds I think uh, that's, by sensible. the way, if you look at like Liebreich's Ladder or talk to the Hydrogen Science Coalition, or that is universally accepted as a sensible yes. use case. No, no one is ever kind of, uh, you know, that is universally agreed upon, I think. What's your opinion on the on the Liebreich ladder, right? Because we're big Michael fans here um, and think he's doing some incredible work. And the ladder really, um, we'll put, uh, again, a link to the show notes, but this is the European way of determining whether houses or washing machines or whatever are um, carbon efficient from A to F, I think it is. Yeah. That same ladder with the different colors on it, <coughs> Michael put together with hydrogen use cases. And it created a massive storm, right? What's your view on that and the use cases and where do you guys fit in? You've got to be rightly kind of thinking, okay, so, you know, I think people use the cake analogy now, right? Hydrogen can't be cheaper than the ingredients that go into the cake. Hydrogen can't be cheaper than the ingredients that go into the cake. Yes, 
there's a lot of input costs. Yeah. Some that are priced well and some that are zero price and there's this thing like floating around of like so we can use hydrogen for everything right we can run economies that build stuff by importing hydrogen from somewhere and they're going to produce power and then they're going to produce products and it's all going to be really cheap in the future and yes. we're like how can that be so and I, I think so and i think what michael's ladder is really useful to do is kind of demonstrate where that's pretty infeasible based mm -hmm. on the applications and also starts to demonstrate that we need to be therefore thinking about where we put public support for these things yeah i think he goes from uncompetitive to sort of like inevitable or something along those lines is yeah so spectrum. top the a the top of the ladder a is unavoidable and bottom of the ladder g which is red that's green and the bottom of the ladder which is the red bit and more colors everybody is uncompetitive and essentially he's saying that top of the ladder is things like fertilizer which you've talked about hydro cracking you've talked about it's basically we're going to do this we you know hydrogen we're going to have to green up these this hydrogen there's some other bits in there, methanol, you know, hydrogenation, chemists will love this. And then it moves down the ladder at the top, there's, there's the shipping, but via ammonia and e-fuels rather than gas or liquid, hydrogen gas. There's steel, long-term storage, off-road vehicles. They're near the top. In the middle, you've got a load of stuff. I, I love the way he's got vintage vehicles in there as well. That's a lovely one. Yeah, it's a, it's a niche category. It's, it's a niche reality. category, but props to, <laughs> props to him for that. And then there's aviation in there, so long haul's more likely to happen with hydrogen or some sort of e-fuel, and then short haul, he reckons, will be batteries. We've got trucks in there, um, you know, the longer distance trucks, which is a small amount of the trucks, will probably be some element of e-fuels or hydrogen. Um, and then further down the ladder, there's, you know, essentially batteries will do stuff instead. And then right at the bottom, we've got, which he says will be uncompetitive, metro trains and buses, hydrogen cars, urban delivery, two-wheelers, e-fuels, power system balancing. So, oh, and domestic heating is right near the bottom. So quite uh, controversial. Um, what's going on there? Well, high level, I agree with the fundamentals of the analysis. Look at a net zero system that's been heavily electrified with lots of renewables in it. There will be, those should be cheaper and therefore electrification makes sense for everything that you can do. So that for me, it makes complete sense to look at it like that. The only lens I add to it, really, and the, the, the thought we have is, okay, but you've got a lot of things where electrification is more challenging, say, from a non-academic perspective, it is from a practical perspective. So as, you know, as is a theme on your podcast generally, grid connections are difficult. Yeah. Grid issues are difficult. So, for example, if you look simplistically at the UK, right, we have two key areas where, like, heavy goods get brought into the country. You know, the Midlands is where a lot of sorting gets done and kind of Milton Keynesy area. That's where there's loads of distribution warehouses. Those are by definition going to be net energy imported areas. There's no renewables built there. So we can either try and get it in transmission wise, power wise, and then fill up trucks with batteries. And we're looking at heat pumps or, you know, AC and the, the, the res large residential loads there. There's a lot of kind of power demand there. Mm -hmm. My hypothesis has always been, and, and my belief from working with operators, et cetera, is that I just don't think if we wait for electrification all that, we'll actually get there. I think there's other things needed. So what we find, for example, is, you know, operators on a three-year lease of their building, there's a truck operator. And so, yes, so there's no grid connection available. If there is, it's 20 to 30 available. Let's do an example. This is like Amazon Warehouse. Yeah, got 200 trucks. HGVs there. 200 heavy goods vehicles, yeah. big Arctic lorries. Yeah. Arctic lorries? Not in the Arctic. Arctic lorries. Yeah. And they're moving stuff around the Half country. a megawatt battery each they'd need, let's say. Yeah. So that's 100 megawatts if you charge them quickly. But let's say, you know, you're looking 20, 30 meg grid connections to support that for a warehouse that's got a one meg grid connection currently. And there's 15 warehouses like that in the same area. So... Is the argument that in, let's talk about trucks, this is an interesting one. So the trade-off, I think, if I understand, is that um, the charging infrastructure it relies on grid, and grid is so slow that we're not going to get the charging infrastructure in time. Therefore, we need to do something else. Therefore, we'll do hydrogen trucks instead. Therefore, a percentage of the trucks will go hydrogen because they will be viable as hydrogen trucks mm. indefinitely, and some will may go hydrogen may go electric it, ultimately we need them to do something and it will depend on the economics of where they land is the way i view it so i i don't see it as 
we will not have 100% hydrogen trucks, but I also don't think we'll have 100% electric trucks. Now, whether hydrogen's 10%, 15%, 20%, 30%, will come down to speed of grid connections, payloads of trucks, driver hours, all those factors. And so that's my only piece, which is, that is great as an academic exercise. And I think policy should reflect what makes sense academically, but you also then have to make sure that you're not dismissing the practical implications of it, you know, like co-location of assets makes sense, but look at an island where you have separate metering arrangements when you've got two assets on the same field, you know, it's a bit of a, you know, mm. regulation gets in the way of what yeah, you want 100%. to happen. What's interesting about this discussion, and um, I think I disagree with you on the on the trucks thing, but we'll come back to it in a minute. And that's okay, We're, we, can, we, we can disagree. What's interesting about this discussion is, there's stuff at the top, we go back to the ladder, there's stuff at the top of the ladder that's definitely gonna happen. Stuff at the bottom of the ladder that probably is gonna be uncompetitive. And then there's the stuff in the middle where I believe, and we probably share this view, that eventually economics will win in the end, right? The lowest cost solution will win, as long as we don't have some really weird subsidies that come in. Yeah, as long as we don't distort the market. As long as we don't distort the market, yeah. So the, the race is on, and um, good luck to everybody. And we're all, the good thing is we're all heading, in, I think we're all trying to head in the same direction, which is the end goal of decarbonisation, which is great. But then the funny thing with hydrogen versus electrification, which is a lot of this middle stuff, is it's not just that economics will win in the in the end, physics will win in the end, right? And yeah. there's that's a lot of the problem with the aviation thing. We talked about it just outside the room, but um, there's a the, the the thing that if you fly New York to London, you need a plane for hydrogen, then you need two planes to refuel the plane, and that that's an example of where the lightness of hydrogen doesn't really work. But that's just aviation. In the the trucking side, I just can't. I don't want to bet against Elon. Right? You know, you got these 500 kilometer trucks that. It's less than two kilowatt hours a mile, I think they were saying, in one of these articles. Which I, I struggle to believe that. Cause really? I've, I've got an Audi e-tron, and I get two miles per kilowatt hour. Two my, miles per kilowatt hour? And my hour. car weighs two tons. I don't know, have I so I'm like, how would a 40-ton truck get anywhere near this competitive? You know I'm what? like, unless it's magical. Like, I know a Tesla Model 3 is about 3.54. So say that a, a car that's a bit lighter is twice as good as my Audi. Hold on, so yeah. I'm like, a truck's nowhere near as good as... What's an hour? So a normal electric car, let's say 100 kilowatt hour battery, and it can do... 200 miles. 200. No, I mean, in the, three, uh, two, Model 3, probably 300. 300. That. So that's a third of a kilowatt hour... Per mile. Per mile. And he's saying that Tesla trucks can do it in... Here we go. So 1.7 kilowatt hours a mile. So that is one, two, three, four, five and a five. bit. Oh, yeah. So five maybe times. Yeah, maybe. So maybe, maybe, maybe it makes sense. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Well, a typical truck does 10 miles per gallon. Typical car does 40 miles per gallon. So yeah, 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 yeah. It's not unreasonable. Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. But so yeah, I just, I just don't know whether I'd bet against that. But the, the, the cool thing about this thing with trucks is the physics does make sense. Right? So the fi- you can get a long-distance truck or even a medium-distance truck powered by hydrogen on the roads, and it will work. It's not like some of these other crazy use cases that just the physics won't work. Yeah, I, like, well, and it's, it's a whole combination of things, right? So you've got, the key thing in trucking is miles you can do in a shift, mm. payload, and then being within the length and the height and the weight regs of the vehicle. Like, so not just the carrying payload, but the total gross weight of the vehicle. Because you can't rock out with a 45, well, a 45 ton gross vehicle in the UK. The limit is 44. We've got enough potholes as it is. No, thank you. Yeah, and what's well, interesting, so in Europe, for example, it's 48 tonnes. So that four tonnes just gives them an extra load of decarbonisation options because they've got four more yeah, tonnes yeah, they can yeah. play with. So there's a there's a whole, like, set, you know, and in the US, I think it's 58 tonnes, the limit. So, <laughs> so you know, like, trucking in the US is crazy. Yeah, so there's, like, yeah. this whole set of things that kind of create a, a kind of complex web of problems because... You know, a lot of the arguments are great. So we're going to have half megawatt battery trucks for, like, driving around, and then every four hours a driver's got to stop anyway legally. Yeah. But I mean, and then the, what a truck goes. Let's say a truck does fifty miles an hour. No, let's say, let's say it's a fast truck, whatever, seventy miles an hour. That means they on each before they come to charge, but they need to find a fast charger before That's they come it. to charge. They can do two hundred. Come on, maths. Two hundred eight. Two hundred miles. Two hundred miles. Two hundred yeah, yeah. yeah. But then, so then they're going to need to get say four hundred kilowatts into that battery in a forty minute. Stop. Yeah, you need a 400 kilowatt charger. Yeah. So you need okay. the grid infrastructure for that. So, so need we, need, we need the same infrastructure that grids are put in at a big service station. And I, you know, I, as an EV driver, I know that's, we need all of those I on every... That <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. I just think, and look, if it happens and it's good, then great, we have a good decarbonisation option. Yeah. But that's my reticence. I don't want us to go all in on one thing and not 
actually get it to happen. Like my view, like what we need to not have is everyone in 15 years time still be using diesel trucks. Yes. And the so, thing is, don't we kind of, <laughs> I get that argument, but then also don't we need to go all in on one because it, it's going to be so much work and so much infrastructure to put in. We kind of got to go one or the other. But It depends on how command and control we are though. Like I guess we just don't do that. Like typically, you know, like the only real thing that we do proper centralized planning around is things like national grid, like the transmission lines, the, the transmission gas networks, maybe nuclear bill. Mm. I mean, like look at EV rollout, you know, like EVs are cheaper than ICE cars now. They are very popular. They outsell them. We still leave it to the market to and solve the problem. And they're, they're great. Drive. Yeah. Yeah. I don't but we we are leaving it to the market to solve the problem. We're not centrally planning it. Yes. And that's yeah, like, yeah, that's my reti- like so, anything that requires a big degree of central <coughs> planning is. But let's do the maths on this for a second. So say um, Elon's truck, let's say he's got, he's got a bit of um, Elon magic in there. Let's say it's not 1.7 kilowatt hours a mile. Let's say it's two kilowatt hours a mile. Um, that will cost, so a kilowatt hour costs you. Um, if you put it in at that speed, it's going to cost you a bit more, right? It's going to cost you a bit more. Let's say it costs him a quid. A kilowatt hour, yeah. A agreed. kilowatt hour. So he's, he's got to spend two pounds a mile on moving that truck around the place. But if you do hydrogen, you've got to pay for the electricity, and then you've got to pay for the conversion costs. What, yeah. How, how efficient is a... So, <coughs> let's say, yeah. So, so that's why I think sourcing power cheaply is the trick to hydrogen being viable. So... Mm. Let's say we target CFD level power prices, fifty pounds a megawatt hour ish. And that's the that's the um, it's another CFD reference on this podcast. But that's what the government essentially has promised to pay wind power producers, and they promised to pay the government. That's the difference. So yeah, wind in the UK, a lot of it is fifty quid ish. Yeah. So say we, I mean, target probably could be done for forty. If we actually had some yeah. onshore <laughs> approvals. But let's say so we do fifty. Let's say we assume that's a baseline. Then we it costs us fifty kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. So it costs us £2.50 to make a kilo of hydrogen just from the power cost. Okay, infrastructure adds 50p for us to, for the plant, as I said, about 70%. Yeah. So it's £3 at, at our wholesale cost to produce our hydrogen. Then we've got to get it to a truck, get it in the truck. The truck costs a bit more capex wise. So we've got leeway to get to that pound, but we're not, you know, because we've got in theory, what we've we got here, we've, we're at 30p, no, we're at 30p a kilowatt hour. Well, this is all that matters, right, is, is the premium for fast charging be- battery electric vehicles, the premium, let's say you pay a quid at grid serve for a big truck, is that premium compared to the wholesale price, which we are there saying is quite a lot, is that premium more or less than the premium you have to pay to convert it into hydrogen, move the hydrogen, get it into the truck, and, and also the additional capex of the truck because hydrogen trucks have got more stuff on them? Yeah, you've got more tanks. parts, yeah. more tanks, more. It's at the moment, it's pretty close TCO wise from an OPEX. An What's op- TCO? Total cost of ownership on a hydrogen truck versus in a battery electric truck. The cost of the fuel, so i.e., hydrogen versus electric, once you consider fast charging versus getting hydrogen to a depot, is pretty similar. Is okay. The problem is a hydrogen truck is twice as expensive as a battery electric truck. Yeah. So you've got because of the capex on the additional stuff in the vehicle. But then the learning curve of hydrogen is probably. 15 years behind the learning curve of battery electric vehicles. So there's an you know, argument to say the capex will come out. But that's why I, I don't, that's what I said, I, 100% will not be 100% hydrogen trucking of the future. Yeah. I also struggle to think that we'll have 100% half megawatt to one megawatt battery, uh, so one megawatt hour to you know, half megawatt hour battery electric trucks is the only solution. I just cannot yeah. see it. By the way, these hydrogen trucks, I've never seen, like, do they make a noise? What's the noise like? What, so, well, this is a, you'll like this bit. So a fuel cell takes in hydrogen, combines it with atmospheric oxygen. It's a roughly, say, 60%, 70% efficient. The other chunk of stuff that comes out is heat. So the main thing you hear is heat discharge, i.e. steam being produced. And oh, out. so it's like going back 100 years with like um, chugging steam engines everywhere. So you get the whir of the E-axle, and then it's just heat dis- dissipation. Why are we talking about trucks? So you guys have got trucks reporting to your business, right? Let's come all the way back, back full <laughs> circle. Um, trucks is not like the key. You guys are truckers, right? You got trucker hats. <laughs> yeah, yeah you got the, like, the, the boop boop thing. No, look, when we started, we were definitely very keen on road-based transport, i.e., trucks. And I think as we've looked at it, we're like, look, we're still keen on it. We think it. We think there'll be a large amount of hydrogen in there, but we also think it'll be a percentage, not the total. Whereas we are very clear that grey hydrogen displacement will be the total will be green. And okay. so I see the ladder as more like you'll probably have one hydrogen car in twenty fifty. 
is my guess. Yeah. But you'll have 100% green hydrogen for refining or ammonia production. Mm. And I just think between it, it'll be percentages of, you know, you'll there'll be some bus fleets running on hydrogen very viably in cities. Most will be well, electric. Well, let's see. <laughs> yeah, and most will, be, yeah. But most will be electric. But then it depends on the city, right? Because if the city's a long way from the nearest renewable energy source, you know, like some of our cities where they're in energy poor areas. Well, yeah, that's a key bit. So how do you get, how do you move the hydrogen around? So yeah, let's, uh, I'm going to build a wind farm in a windy place, I hope, otherwise yeah. I'm an idiot. And so that windy place might be quite remote. Uh, and then you guys stick an electrolyzer on it. Okay, so we've, we've, let's say we've created, we've got like a 20 gigawatt of power. 20 megawatt. 20, sorry. <laughs> I wish I did 20 yeah, gigs. Yeah. <laughs> 20, so let's, let's do 10. So I've got a 10 megawatt wind farm. How much? No, 10 megawatt electrolyzer, so you've got a 50 meg wind, a 30 meg wind farm. Yeah, but let's say input power is 10 megawatts. Yeah. How, and then the electrolyzer, what's the efficiency on turning that into hydrogen? About 50 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So I'm, I'm giving them a capacity factor of the wind and how we'd optimize it. We'll produce about a ton of hydrogen from that. What is it in kilowatt hours? So let's say, I'd, say I've got 10 kilowatt hours of power produced from my wind farm. How much, once I've turned it into hydrogen, how much kilowatt hours equivalent is that in hydrogen, do you know? You get 33 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. You'd produce about 33 megawatt hours of power of usable hydrogen a day. A day. With no losses on the... So what's the efficiency of an electrolyzer? In, out? You have to do it reverse, right? So the theoretical efficiency of converting water to hydrogen and oxygen is 39.4 kilowatt hours, I think. And we can do it about 50 52 kilowatt hours so it's whatever that is 39 over 52 one over that so it's about 80 percent ish so let's say, you lose, right, say 70. let's say you lose 30 percent of your power turn it into hydrogen and you've got your hydrogen which you store in tanks and then how do you get that to where do you so we we at the moment focus on road-based distribution of that hydrogen rather so you, than putting it into the gas grid i mean pipes are much cheaper but yeah there's no hydrogen pipes so you put them on like arctic lor lorries so you can get about 10 mega, 10, a 10 mega electrolyzer's worth of hydrogen would be one lorry's worth a day in terms of weight. Yeah, okay. okay so that one mega. lorry has 33 megawatt hours in, in its payload is what it's driving off with. Wow. That's a lot. That's, that's a big, it's like driving around a bomb. It's a lot better <laughs> than a battery in that sense. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's one of those things. Yeah, it's the, 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 the gravity density of it. I don't, I'm not a chemist, but or even a physicist. But how much it weighs... It's really efficient. But how much volume it takes up is really inefficient, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the most energy dense. Oh, we know it's sort of some nuclear things, but it's the most energy dense gr weight wise. But then people. Yeah. So we've got. So we've made ten megawatt hour. So yeah, we've got one hundred percent of our power. We lose thirty percent of that power to turn it into hydrogen. So we've got seventy percent of the power <coughs> left, and then we have to put it on road transport, which was going to cost us some power to yep. get it there. Uh, I don't know what that works out. And then we have to convert it back to something else to use it later. Exactly. And do we lose 30% converting it back? Roughly. Some people say it's like a bit more, but yeah. So you're probably looking at getting, yeah, 30 to 40% of the energy back out the other end of it. So we need to get comfortable with, if we're going to use this hydrogen this way, for every spin of that wind turbine, in very simple terms, you only get a third of the spin at yeah. the end. Which, by the way, is exactly why we should electrolyze many things as we can mm. but equally our whole fossil fuel economy is built on like well or road-based transport is built on 25 percent efficiency of diesel engines yeah you know yeah, jet yeah, turbines. Yeah. so where we can electrify we can go from being 25 percent efficient to 90 percent efficient but where we can't we're not competing with the world of perfect efficiency today we're competing with we are more efficient than the world that exists today in fossil fuels it's just yeah, we're not as good electrification different. it's really important to it's kind of that yeah, pragmatism agreed. i think because that, that we're not trying to electrification will be cheaper because it's efficient and and with a battery if you th but there's a life there's a whole life cycle cost to a battery that doesn't really get talked about that much but with a battery say it's 95 percent round trip, uh 90 percent round trip efficiency you lose five in and five out uh if you only stay in dc and on it that, that's like 90% of the power that comes from you, you get 90% of the spin of a wind turbine in the wheels compared to if you're- As AC, right? As and AC, then you've got yeah. Get, yeah. But, so, but on that, so just it's a useful segue. So there's different types of hydrogen projects, the way I see it, but let's categorize them. So you've got, okay, two broad buckets. You've got ones that are export focused and ones that are co-located with the application. So i.e. You, you build your hydrogen production 
where you need the hydrogen. And you've got ones where you build hydrogen production where the renewables are cheap and then export it. There's the hydrogen hubs thing, which is quite popular, being talked about a lot. Yeah, and then the big question is scale. Yes. So, so right, let me touch on the sort of feasibility of them. So the smallest scale projects are, I want to produce some hydrogen, say a megawatt's worth, at mm. a location to put into some vehicles. I think that's the least competitive type of hydrogen production because you've got all the problems of grid distribution. Yeah. But you save yourself moving hydrogen around. So there's, so you get effectively all the negatives of constrained electricity systems, but with very small volumes of hydrogen at the end. I, I don't think that's a viable strategy. Mm. Where I do think it makes sense is to have offshore large transmission connected hydrogen production at things like ports and stuff, you mm -hmm. know, into the hundreds and hundreds of megawatts or gigawatt scale. That kind of makes sense to me because you're kind of saying, I don't need the renewables to be cheap here. I'm going to transmission it in and it's going to, but I've got a lot of uses in one place. So the hub model or the ports model kind of thing works to me. Then the opposite side is export-based hydrogen focus, which is what we do at a regional scale, i.e. we build where we have renewable assets that are being built, so curtailed wind in Scotland or solar in England, and we'll take the hydrogen to where it's needed. Or you build where it's very, very high capacity factors and low uh, of wind and solar, and then try and export it elsewhere. Now, there's scepticism around those type of projects, because in theory, yeah, great, we've got a combined capacity factor of 90%, and therefore, you know... There's a whole transmission problem to solve, right? Exactly. So we, we think we're kind of in a pragmatic regional scale at the moment, and I can see moving to the kind of gigawatt scale with transmission connected where the offshore wind piece is. The other two I'm a bit sceptical on. I'm not saying they're not viable, but yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be putting my money into a 50 gigawatt, you know, in... X geography that needs to based on a world's kind of globally traded hydrogen economy and I also wouldn't be building very small hydrogen productions because you've got all the problems of grid and you're not mitigating any of it so for me I think those two reasonably sized kind of 100 megawatt gigawatt scale hydrogen hubs or regional distributed hydrogen models with co-located renewables is where it makes sense and the other two I'm a bit more like eh, maybe let's see yeah. where the market goes what's interesting another interesting thing about this whole conversation is there is no, is hydrogen good, is hydrogen bad, right? And what I've really liked about this conversation with you is, I think, if I said, to, I'm a, here's a test, right? <clears throat> hydrogen for domestic heat, thoughts? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I've recently hired someone who's awesome called Danielle, and she keeps telling me I need to not get drawn into this debate. But <laughs> my view is, look, heat pumps, heat pumps are more efficient, like incredibly more efficient, and they, mm. they are like one of our secret sources against climate change. What 100%. other things can you put one in and you get four out? Like, you know, they are awesome. And they are also very popular in cold climates. Yeah, speak to the Scandies. <laughs> they can't believe we still burn gas. Yeah, so I'm very long heat pumps and really struggle to see how hydrogen will play a role in domestic heat in terms of both in terms of uh, lowering costs for domestic customers or not, or not materially increasing costs for domestic customers and also just the pure volume of hydrogen you need. And I don't buy the argument of choice because I think if you give people a choice to pay four times for energy, they're not going to choose it. Um, and a, the poor quality of housing stock is not the point that needs to be fixed anyway. So I just don't think ultimately hydrogen into the gas network, whether it be on a blended or a pure basis, is going to be a viable strategy. That That's my position, I, you know. I think Agreed. we probably need to jump up and down slightly less about it, but yes, that's my position. But it's funny, like it's part of, if you're in the hydrogen economy, like your business, you're you're flanked by some some pretty crazy ideas and 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 interests. And what's been good about this conversation, I think, is you've managed. You, you guys are forging your own path, but in a pragmatic way, uh, which I think is you know we we do have some disagreements and i'd love to have you back on the podcast in a year or two's time and we can talk about where it's going and i hope i hope you're successful and i hope it's the best way i hope it's the best solution or, or, or what you guys are following and certainly solving problem one we talked about before sounds like a great opportunity but Just yeah not, i was going to say the thing that we focus on though so by working with renewable projects our view is that the trick to making hydrogen affordable is shaping when you produce it mm. so our view is that if you envisage a world with an overbuild of renewables, which we do, mm. in order to hit our needs of power and not have to have the, like you know handle the big, what's it called that German word for no wind, no yeah, yeah. something Dum oh, dumbbell, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say, it, but I just offend any. <laughs> it's in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, German speaking listeners, apologies. Um, but the point being, I, I think we're going to have a world with lots of 
additional electrons that are green at times. And we see hydrogen production kind of going after that gap. So where batteries are going after the one, two, maybe six hour mark, but there's batteries in here, hydrogen adds value by shaping our overall renewable output. And whether it goes into long duration storage, whether it goes into refineries, ammonia production, HGVs, like these are all potential avenues for it. But what we're not saying is let's double down on building dedicated hydrogen infrastructure to do things like domestic heat, because I think that's a, a poor use of society's capital. Mm. So it's kind of like a... That's the big thing, right? We've got limited resource, limited people. Yeah, li that's, I like that, society's capital. What's the best, most efficient way to distribute it? At, uh, we'll get to distribution in another podcast, but... Uh, well, like we've got a project it. in Scotland where we are literally taking a wind farm that's, I think it's 70 meg, but it was a third constrained on its export. So we literally take, we take the third out of that and a bit more. So like net net, you've now got a 70 meg wind farm that's more viable than mm. it was because we're taking producing hydrogen from it. Like it's, it's a win across the board. Now, obviously, so as so you build- It'd be good if there was a hydrogen, sit, some of them needed hydrogen near that. I mean, uh, yeah. this is, th so that's the only sympathy I've got sometimes when people talk about, if we could put it into the gas grid and it come out somewhere else, it would be super helpful. Mm. But then you get into, can you extract hydrogen from the methane? Is it? creating a longer term dependency. I don't want to get into that whole, you know, so hence why I think keeping it pure as hydrogen and distributing it's probably a cleaner strategy for us right now. Awesome. So, I mean, look, before we finish, I just want to say thanks for a sensible conversation where we uh, respectfully disagreed on a few things, but we got there. And I think what you guys are doing is really, really interesting. And it will have its mark, right? Especially if you can solve problem one, it'll have its mark. And we'll see what happens with, with problem two, three, four, and five. Um, I want to give you the chance. Is there anything that you haven't talked about that you want to raise or talk about or plug? Yes, I suppose the only thing I would plug is I know you've got a large renewable developer listener base. Mm. And, I, and I, for us, it's all about saying, look, we think hydrogen is complementary to building new build renewables. And so, yeah, get in touch if you want to chat about it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so we'll put your contact details everywhere. They'll be plastered everywhere and um, people can get in touch. So thank you very much for coming on and um, we will have you back sometime in the future and we'll see how this thing is growing. Yeah, be exciting. Thanks very much. <laughs>